Good evening, Mr. Hojiri. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The, um, the Institute uh, for Mathematical Sciences, or in short, IMS, provides a platform for interaction between mathematicians and scientists. It also organizes outreach programs such as public lectures like this one. And in fact, this is the uh, second public lecture associated uh, with the current spring school on uh, fluid mechanics and, the, and geophysics of environmental hazards. And, and, and geo, geo, geophysics of environmental hazards. Um, and the uh, uh, speaker for tonight's uh, public lecture is a very distinguished applied mathematician from the uh, University of Cambridge, Professor Keith Moffat. Now, uh, Professor Moffat is uh, an old friend of the Institute, having served as a founding member of its scientific advisory board for almost eight years, and having guided the uh, Institute in its early development. Um, we are really very grateful to him uh, for the um, help that he's given us and for the guidance that he's given us over in, in all these years. Now, um, Professor Moffat is a former director of the Isaac Newton Institute for Medical Sciences, a bigger brother, a big brother of our institute, uh, which is actually modeled after the Newton Institute. And he is also a past president of the International Union of Theoretical and Applied Mechanics. He has also served on many other uh, advisory boards and councils of institutes and centers. He has received many honors and awards. Here is a sample of his awards. He is a fellow of the Royal Society, a foreign member of the academies of France, Italy, and Netherlands and a foreign member of the National Academy of Sciences, USA. He holds honorary doctorates from a number of universities, including his alma mater, Edinburgh University. He has been awarded many prizes, including the Hughes Medal of the Royal Society, the Euromed Prize for Fleet Dynamics, and the Senior Whitehead Prize of the London Medical Society. So uh, it is really a great pleasure to have him here uh, giving us this public lecture entitled Randall Mac Reversals, a prototype of Chiro or Chiro, Cairo, Cairo Dynamics. It's my pleasure to you. And thank you for inviting me to give this public lecture. I've greatly enjoyed my contact with IMS over the years, and it's always a great privilege to come here, come back to Singapore, and particularly on this occasion uh, when we've been running a two-week uh, spring school, as you've heard, and many of the students of the spring school are here this evening. The lecture I'm going to give will, I think, um, appear like light relief for you compared with some of the hard work you've had over the last 10 days or so. On the other hand, you will, I think, see some interesting similarities. We all know that in the context of uh, the Earth's meteorology and climate and oceanography, Coriolis forces are of dominant importance when you're on large scales. And in the laboratory, or even in the home, you can observe the action of Coriolis forces by playing with simple spinning toys. And there's a great variety of these. Of course, we call them tops. But there's a great variety of tops. And I'm going to show you several this evening, and each of which, um, each of which illustrates a fundamental principle of mechanics, which has very wide uh, application outside the very narrow context of toys. But it's interesting that one can learn a lot from simply playing with toys and from trying to understand why they behave 
in the sometimes paradoxical way that they do. Now, uh, the title refers to rattleback reversals. So what is the rattleback? It's um, a rather special toy. Oh, before I, I get to this, uh, the rattleback, I want to show you this rather famous photograph. Two famous physicists of the 20th century, two of the great uh, names, Niels Bohr from Denmark, Wolfgang Pauli, um, from Austria, I think he was, uh, investigate the spin of the tippy top at the inauguration of the Institute of Physics in Lund, Sweden, in 1954. This statement is attributed to Niels Bohr. How wonderful that we've met with a paradox. Now we have some hope of making progress. Now the tippy top, you may know, it's, it's quite a well-known toy. It's a little top uh, which is spherical in the region where it makes contact with the table on which it spins. <coughs> um, but the center of the sphere does not coincide with the center of gravity because the top of the, there's a sort of section of the uh, sphere that is cut off at the top and it's a little bit like a, a mushroom upside down. Um, so actually the center of gravity is below the center of the sphere and that makes it, uh, the object stable when in that position when you uh, lay it on the table. It takes a little time, it's just stable, but it settles down with the stroke of the mushroom upwards. But um, if you spin that, I'll spin it on a tray here for a particular reason, if I can, partly to prevent it going off. Um, if I succeed in spinning it fast enough, it'll turn upside down. And that is uh, I'm quite, oh, we'll do it, we'll do it, we'll do it, um, we'll do it on the table and give it a little more room. And, uh, at, um, I always have some difficulty with this one. I hope I can do it. Oh, dear, dear, dear. <laughs> this is a bad start. <laughs> we'll try again. We'll try again. <clears throat> well, now, we'll do it here. You see, it just rose on its end before it left the table. We'll try once more. It takes a lot of practice. <laughs> ah, ah, I really need a slightly bigger table. <laughs> ah, we're very nearly there. I'm sorry. I would like to be able to do it. Uh, you see, it's trying very hard at the end, but I'm not, I'm aging, and that's the trouble. You need a lot of spin in your fingers to get it to rise on its end. It's obviously trying to do that. We'll try again later, and one of the younger participants may be able to achieve this. But anyway, that is what uh, is fascinating Niels Bohr and Wolfgang Pauli. Of course, Bohr, famous for his theory of the atom, the electrons spinning around the nucleus, and uh, Wolfgang Pauli, famous for the spin matrices of quantum mechanics. Um, so, great physicists of this kind can find uh, a simple toy, like the tippy top, fascinating. Actually, it looks to me as if that one has not risen up, so they're having a similar difficulty that I'm having. Um, the rattleback, I will show you in a moment. It's um, strange for the following reason. It's shaped like a canoe. Actually, two of these, you see three objects on that uh, little tray. Two of them are, are rattlebacks, and the third is not. So it's not obvious. They all look rather similar shape like canoes. Two are rattlebacks, and the third is not. A rattleback will rotate smoothly in one direction, but when you try to spin it in the opposite direction, it wobbles and the spin direction reverses. Now we'll do this on the projector here. Um, and it's this one we want to use. Two, one. Oh, we get that on. Okay. Oh, it takes time. 
we just let it warm up a little. So why? This is the question. Perhaps, Professor Chen, you might like to examine this rattleback. <laughs> <laughs> and you. Oh, yes, I'll give you one that's not a rattleback. It is something else, <laughs> but it's not a rattleback. It does. Uh, <laughs> it's one of these. One of these. Uh, yes, it's more like a bullet. It's like a canoe, right? Yeah. Like a canoe. A little canoe. Perhaps not very well made as a canoe. Flat on top. Curved underneath. I lay it on the plane here. It will have one point of contact. And at this point of contact, it has two, two different radii of curvature. That is a rather important feature. One radius of curvature that is large and another that is small. Well, I think this is the way I'll rotate it um, anticyclonically. Is that the convention? No. <laughs> and uh, there is, it's just going to come gently to rest. So you might say, well, this is an extremely dull toy. So we'll try it in the opposite direction. And, uh, well, maybe I did it badly. Maybe I did it badly. I'll try again. I'll try and do it as smoothly as I can. He doesn't like that direction. <laughs> so once again, there, the good direction. No problem. No problem just gently comes to rest, and you can see it's very, very apparently steady, steady behavior, and we'll do it just one. Well, I'll do it with a different one. Um, I've got a different color, just in case you might think it's something to do with the optics. So, <laughs> well, it may be something to do with the rotation of the Earth. What do you think? Well, no, because we're so near the equator. It's only the vertical component of the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, field. I'm a, I work in magneto hydrodynamics, so sometimes I slip into magnetic terminology. The vertical component of the rotation vector of the Earth that is relevant. So that's most unlikely. Ah, it does the same. It does not like to rotate in that direction. So we've got a problem. We have to explain this behavior. And I will explain it. Um, however, before I do so, I'll show you the other toys that I have. Because I'm very likely to run out of time in the mathematics. It would be an awful pity to have brought all these toys and uh, not show them to you. And I may have time to. I'll explain what I can of the various toys. Um, <clears throat> the second. Actually, this is going in reverse order historically. The rattleback is the one that I've uh, been working on most recently. We published a, published a paper last year <coughs> with a colleague in Cambridge, Japanese colleague now uh, resident in Cambridge, Tadashi Tokeda. Uh, and we published a paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Edinburgh on this phenomenon. But it was the third in a series of toys and the second was the problem of the so-called, we call it the problem of the rising egg. Um, this is very well known and it can be conducted in any home environment. You take a hard-boiled egg. It's very important that it should be hard-boiled. Boil it for about 10 minutes to be sure it's hard-boiled. And then, this one I should, I hope, be able to do, even although the table is a little bit... Uh, Well, firstly, of course, that's the position of equilibrium. You can, can you all see it? Um, and if I try and balance it on its end, as uh, Christopher Columbus was asked to do, um, you can't. You can't do it. Uh, it falls over. It's unstable. 
And actually, that's what I would describe as a fast instability. The instability is governed simply by the fact that the center of mass of the egg, in this case, is above. Uh, well, it, 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 uh, the potential energy decreases as it falls over. So energy, energy is a maximum when I try to balance it, and it's a minimum in that position. That is obvious. Well, if we spin this egg on the table, you see what happens. It rises on its end. Which end it rises on is a matter of great debate. There's a slightly sharper end and a slightly rounder end. It can rise on either, and it depends on exactly how you, and if you're very clever, you see, you can make it rise on either end, because it depends how you tilt it slightly when you start off. So if you master the art of egg spinning, you can actually make money out of it by taking bets as to which way it will rise. And when you do it, you can always make it rise the, the way you want it. Um, but it all the important thing is that it always, well, not always. No, if I spin it slowly, it won't do it. If I spin it rapidly enough, it will rise on its end and spin quite stably with its axis vertical. That is uh, the result of what I would describe as a slow instability. It's actually, it's a longer, slower time scale for the egg to rise than the falling over that I indicated earlier, the fast instability. And why it's called slow is that it, it's, um, another term for it is a dissipative instability. It depends, it works only when there is slipping friction between the egg and the table. As soon as I spin the egg, it actually starts, it tries to rise a little, or it goes into a wobble. And when it wobbles, it begins to slip on the table. And the slip exerts a frictional force. And the frictional force, because you're in a rapid, if you take a system rotating with the egg quite rapidly, the Coriolis force comes into play in the rotating frame. And you all know that the Coriolis force makes that force, turns it through a right angle, turns it into a force in that direction, which is such as to raise the egg to the vertical. So it's slipping friction that does it. And that involves dissipation of energy. Well, there's still a problem to solve, because if you dissipate energy, how is it that the potential energy can increase as it rises to the vertical? Well, the answer is, obviously, it's not just potential energy in this problem. There's a lot of kinetic energy when you spin it fast enough. So that's the first clue we want to think of the energy and how the total energy can decrease as you go from there to there, even although the potential energy part increases. The kinetic energy must decrease more than the potential energy increases. So that's the second problem. The third problem is one that I've actually lectured on here before in, in uh, Singapore about 10 years ago, when I first came. I think I gave a lecture maybe in the maths department on this problem. It's called the Euler disk, named after, of course, the great Euler. And um, it is just a disk. Again, these things are very simple. It's quite a heavy disk. Um, and it's very well machined. It's uh, very smooth, made of steel. It weighs about half a pound. And you can set that in rotation. And I said, normally in, on, in rotation, on a, it's a very, very slightly concave dish. That's just to keep it in one place. You set it in rotation on its rim. And you wait till it and see what happens. Now, this actually is a very interesting problem in my opinion. And I'm going to use the microphone to let you hear what happens. Um, there are two variables. One is the angle that the disk makes with the horizontal. And that angle is bound to decrease slowly with time. It's got to stop eventually, we know that. Although it seems to be going on for quite a long time. <laughs> it's like a spinning penny, but this is a very heavy penny. This is the way pennies used to be. <laughs> now, there's the angle. There's also the angular velocity of the point of contact, which is going around in a circle. 
And actually, that angular velocity accounts for the, you can almost hear a little hum. That's the frequency associated with that movement, which is sending out a sound wave that you can hear. And you may be able to detect that it seems to be going up. Speed is increasing. Now, this is another paradox. The speed appears to be increasing as time goes on. Why is that? So we have to try and explain it now. It's coming near the end. It's not like, um, say, a pendulum that comes to rest as a result of friction. We know there that the amplitude decreases exponentially with time, and eventually, very gently, it comes to rest. This does something very dramatic, and it calls out, it demands explanation, a phenomenon of this kind. We've got, on the one hand, an angular velocity. It's actually a precessional angular velocity, which is increasing as the angle alpha goes to zero. On the other hand, it increases, and then it somehow reaches a crisis point, and it stops dead. And one wants to understand why it is. Now, for a mechanical system of this kind, that's what I would describe as a, a finite time singularity. You waited a finite time, actually about a minute and a half. The world record is about four minutes. Um, but that needs very, very carefully controlled conditions and very careful, starting very but four minutes, it will continue. Here, it would be about a minute and a half, I think. It's a good solid table, that's important. Um, but still, I don't know if anyone timed that. We could do it again and see. We could try and beat the world record. <laughs> but um, a finite time, anyway. And then, boom, it stops like that. So a singularity at finite time. Now, this is terribly interesting because we um, uh, encounter such things in other fields of physics, and particularly in fluid mechanics. So I'll come back to that uh, a little later. So let me now come back to the rattleback. Um, and I should say that there are different kinds of rattleback. Here's another one, and this has been fabricated out of wood. I think it was originally made in Russia. And you can find out about these things on the web if you Google Rattleback. So I'll, I'll do this uh, again on this um, table. We'll, um, now it is off. Uh, I'm sorry, we have to. Oh, good. Yeah. Turn both of them on, do we? One and two. Now, this um, is a, a rather ingenious little Rattleback, but it illustrates. Uh, part of the properties of the object. Um, it's a, a wooden canoe, which is actually perfectly symmetric. But on it are mounted two little turtles. You see them, which can be rotated. And uh, to begin with, we can put them with their heads pointing both out from the end of the rattle bag. And in that situation, we can rotate it one way. There's a little bit of a wobble, but nothing very dramatic. And we can rotate it the opposite way. Nothing very dramatic. So we've got to do something to turn it into a rattle bag. Well, that something that we do is this. We turn one head one way and one head the other way. You see now the turtles are pointing to the side. Now, it's well known that turtles like to move forwards, so we can test that hypothesis. <laughs> well, they're rocking a bit, but they are moving forwards. You can actually detect a tiny bit of reversal at the end, which is interesting. So we can come back to that. Now. It's equally well known that they do not like to move backwards. 
they, they violently object to that, and they so there's a there's an asymmetry here. There's something we've done something dramatic to this system, and what we've done from a mechanical point of view is this: we haven't changed the canoe, we haven't changed the radii of curvature. So there are two principal directions of the radius radii of curvature at the point of contact. But what we've changed in rotating these little turtles is that we have rotated the axis of inertia, principal axis of inertia, slightly, very slightly, relative to the principal axis of curvature. And that is one of the key properties of the rattleback. The other, as I mentioned, is the difference in the two radii of curvature. So take any object. Now let's look again at the, the red one. Let's look at it with a more critical eye. And when you put it there, you see that it, there's um, the optics give the show away. See that optical, what looks like an optical axis. The red line is very slightly S-shaped. So it's as if there is a slight deformation of this object. And um, it is indeed a, a very slight deformation into an S-shape. And the other one's the same. I think these come with a made with different dye but from the same machine. I've never, funny enough, bought a commercial rattleback that has the S the opposite way in order to give a rattleback that behaves in precisely the opposite manner. You have to make one of these. Well, you can do it with the, um, you can test it with the turtles, of course. But anyway, that these rattlebacks uh, exhibit this property. Now, there's something else that's a little bit funny. If I just lay it down a little bit carelessly, it rotates in the good direction. Um, it never rotates in the bad direction. You just lay it down. You've got to lay it down extremely carefully if you to avoid it going into that rotation. And the point is, as soon as you lay it down, you, there's a little. There's always a little bit of perturbation. Actually, if I tip it there, that's enough to set it rotating. <laughs> So we want to be sure that when we get the right mathematical model describing all this, that sort of property will come out of the equations. How do we tip it? Let's do it that way now. This is more difficult. I'll tip it that way. Oh dear, you already turn it upside down. Uh, no, I, I can't quite do it. Oh, even that makes it go in the, in the, in the good direction. Uh, I, do, I try that for, for another, a particular reason also. Um, okay. Um, well, I think we can turn this off. Yeah, turn this off. Okay. We can go to the next. Now, there's something interesting here. You saw this picture already. this picture already today. Dr. Vera showed a picture of Sir Gilbert Walker this morning. And I promise you I had this uh, transparency prepared before, <laughs> before this morning. Um, this is from Wikipedia. And I show you this for a very special reason. He wrote the first paper on the rattleback. Or the technical name for this uh, toy is the CELT. I'll make a comment on that. The title of his paper was simply On a Dynamical Top. And you see the date, 1896. 
so long time ago. Now, Walker, very interesting man, you see, and very relevant to this program. Look at this. Born 1868. British physicist and statistician of the 20th, one of the greats of the 20th century, early 20th century. Best known for his groundbreaking description of the Southern Oscillation, SO, a major phenomenon of global climate and for greatly advancing the study of climate in general. Of course, Enzo, El Nino, Southern Oscillation. Walker, as Dr. Behera indicated, the origin, the discoverer of this oscillation. So then some, oh yeah, look, he attended St. Paul's School, West Kensington, that's in London, and Trinity College, Cambridge, where he was senior wrangler in 1889. Um, Wranglers are those who attained first class honors in part two of the mathematical tripos. And before 1907, I think was the critical year, the Wranglers were ordered by number. The senior Wrangler was the first, the top of the list, and the 20th Wrangler was the 20th in the list, and so on. To be the senior Wrangler was a tremendous honor. It indicated somebody who was uh, extremely efficient at passing examinations and solving every kind of, of problem that the examiners could devise. So he was the senior wrangler. It also indicated, of course, great technical ability and uh, dedication. So he was an established applied mathematician at Cambridge University, uh, and that is when he wrote this paper and others. He was very famous for uh, a paper he wrote on the boomerang, the mechanic, which of course involves fluid mechanics, um, and uh, that, that was an interesting paper um, in the late 18th century. But anyway, he became Director General of Observatories in India in 1904. While there, he studied the characteristics of the Indian Ocean monsoon, the failure of whose rains had brought severe famine to the country in 1899, analyzing vast amounts of data from India and lands beyond, in other words, Singapore. <laughs> uh, it was called something else in those days. Oh, it was still Singapore, but it was Malay uh, straight settlement or whatever. Um, over the next 15 years, he published the first descriptions of the great seesaw oscillation of atmosphere atmospheric pressure between the Indian and Pacific Ocean. Extraordinary. We've just been hearing about this just this morning. And its correlation to temperature and rainfall patterns across much of the Earth's tropical region, including India. Walker continued his studies of yearly weather and climate change after his return in India uh, and acceptance of a professorship in meteorology in London. Died in 1958. Very interesting. I had occasion to look at the Royal Society um, biographical memoir of Walker uh, just a few weeks ago. It was written by G.I. Taylor. A very, very interesting memoir it is, too. Anyway, I show you this obviously because he wrote the first paper on the rattleback, and it was very good. He he recognized the he did experiments. He made rattlebacks, and uh, um, he uh, had a pretty good physical understanding of the reason for this, but he couldn't prove it. Now, uh, this is the paper that I've written with uh, Tadashi Tokieda published last year. Um, we made a comment on Walker's use of the word self. Um, the Oxford English Dictionary, the very large dictionary that is the fount of knowledge on the English language, says this, though always confused with Celt, pronounced Celt, as in Celtic peoples. Now, I have a personal interest in this because I am a Celtic person. The Celtic fringe we talk about, the uh, Scottish the Irish, the Welsh, the Bretons, uh, and so on. These people are the Celtic races, the Celtic people. It is a separate word, in fact, pronounced Celt. And uh, the definition, an implement with chisel-shaped edge of bronze or stone, but sometimes of iron, found among the remains of prehistoric man. So I think of the rattleback used by prehistoric man as a tool Stone Age man, a tool. But you can imagine him at the end of a hard day, 
uh, wandering on the beaches of Scotland um, and having nothing else to do, he would be playing with stones that he found on the beach, trying to spin them. And once in a while, once in a thousand years or so, he would come across an unusual shaped stone which would behave in this strange manner. So I think of it as one of the first, one of the earliest um, mechanical phenomena that would be known to man. Actually, the axis of the canoe is, as you've seen, slightly twisted into an S shape. That means it's not the same as its mirror image, in the same way that the mirror image of a right hand looks like a left hand. The word chirality just means handedness, and the property of handedness, lack of mirror symmetry. When the rattleback spins counterclockwise, you may have noticed that a pitching instability develops. This takes energy from the spin and leads, in fact, to the reversal that you noticed. So the pitching instability is this instability that we experienced the other day on our way to St. John's Island. We also experienced the rolling instability. So there are two possible instabilities. Actually, a boat tends to move in three senses because it heaves up and down as well with the waves, and it's that combination, usually with incommensurate frequencies, that leads to seasickness because the ear balance mechanisms can't quite cope. Now, similarly, the two frequencies here of the pitching instability and the rolling instability are different. They're different because, well, it's obvious. There's no reason why they should be the same. One is um, rather rapid, relatively rapid, and the other is slow. The ratio is about four for this uh, commercial toy, about four. But you can make rattlebacks with different geometrical dimensions that have any value for this ratio of frequencies. And these two frequencies can be very easily calculated. For example, you can assume that this is to first approximation like an ellipse, a spheroid, a spheroid, but cut through the middle, through its center. That's not a bad model. And then you can work out the two basic frequencies. That's neglecting the slight deformation into an S shape. But that deformation into an S shape is of crucial importance. As you see, I've said, when the rattleback spins counterclockwise, a pitching in, the pitching instability develops, which extracts, it's got to get its energy from somewhere, that instability, it gets it from the rotation. So the rotation decreases. And if the pitching instability is strong enough, the rotation decreases to zero and passes through zero, and you get the reversal. Well, we've got to see the mathematics of that. When it spins the other way, clockwise, in fact, the pitching instability disappears, but a weaker rolling instability appears, develops. It's weaker, its growth rate is smaller, and its uh, frequency is different. And this can actually also lead to spin reversal. Only the shape near the point of contact, P, matters. And if I take O, X, Y, the principal directions, principal horizontal axis of inertia. Now remember, for the turtles, we, the axis of inertia are slightly different from the axis of curvature. So if I take the principal axis of inertia as our frame O, X, Y at the point P, then lo locally, the equation of the rattleback surface is Z. Now, take Z at the center of mass. And it'll be Z equals minus 1 if I normalize it to the point of contact. But nearby, it's perturbed proportional to x squared one way, y squared the other way. But also with an xy in here because of this slight twist, the S shape, and because the axes don't coincide. So there's a small coefficient here called, well, we'll call it chi seems uh, much less than one, chi for chirality. It's a good choice because the word chi in Greek is the word for hand. So the word chiral comes handedness. So we'll use the Greek letter chi. And that represents the small misalignment of the principal axis of curvature of P and the principal moments of inertia. 
Now, I don't want to get into the mathematics. It's not appropriate for the, it's quite elaborate the mathematics of this because to do the you can imagine the stability taking account of this and taking account of when it's spinning is uh, quite a complex matter, even using linearized equations. That stability problem, the linear stability problem, was actually solved by another famous man, and that's Hermann Bondi, the cosmologist. He wrote a paper on the rattle back in 1984, published in Proceedings of the Royal Society, and he worked out the stability criteria when the, an object of this kind is rotating one way, and he worked out when there, this type of instability will appear and uh, when it doesn't. But he stopped at that point. He got the two instabilities, the pitching one, the rolling one, when it's going the other way. He worked out these instabilities, but he couldn't explain why it reverses. And to do that, you've got to go to the next level. You've got to go to nonlinear or quadratic uh, terms in all the governing equations. Um, now, that's uh, quite a tricky business. See, on linear theory, you might get um, an oscillation with an amplitude, pitching oscillation with an amplitude A. When you go to nonlinear theory, that amplitude can slowly change. It becomes a slowly varying function of time. That's slow relative to the frequency with which you have the oscillation. So you get the idea you've got to bring in two time scales. The time scales characteristic of the instabilities, in other words, the frequencies, and a slow time scale on which the amplitudes can change and the rotation can change. So what I'm going to show you next, I think, is the slow time equations the result from this. And if any are interested in details afterwards, I can show you how these equations are derived. Once you've derived them, they're actually very simple. They're wonderfully simple equations. Three equations. For A, the amplitude of pitching. B, the amplitude of rolling. And N, the spin rate about the vertical. And all of these depend on a slow time variable. They vary slowly with time. We just call that t now. And there are the equations. The a by dt, now 4 applies to the rattle back. It would be a parameter lambda for a general body. But I've chosen the value that uh, refers to this particular object. And it is about, as I said, 4, the ratio of the frequencies that comes in here. Times n, that's the spin, the spin rate which can be positive or negative. The amplitudes A and B are, by definition, positive. An amplitude, positive. N can be positive or negative. Minus mu 1A. Now, you can see that that is like a damping of dA by dt. On its own, it would give exponential damping. That's because there is always some kind of damping of an oscillation. When you oscillate uh, an object, it comes to rest. And it's uh, more or less. This is one of the difficulties of this problem. We have no means of calculating the values of these three damping coefficients, mu1, mu2, mu3. It's not known how to do it. They're what you might describe as semi-empirical friction parameters. It seems very reasonable to introduce them, but we don't know how to calculate the values. Uh, unlike well, it's a little bit like uh, viscosity in fluid mechanics. Great difficulty in calculating it from fundamental principles, but we can measure it for air, measure it for water. We can measure mu1, mu2, mu3 by measuring the rate of damping uh, of the oscillations when there's no spin and no other uh, complications and no chirality, because actually this first term comes in through the Chirality. Chirality is embedded in the scaling of these equations as well. It's not obvious where it comes from. And the last equation, actually, you see if all the frictional coefficients are zero in this, if you have an ideal non-dissipative system, then energy is conserved. And that last equation can be obtained on that basis, conservation of energy. Energy, spin plus the two modes, the energy in the two modes is a constant of the equations. 
there's actually a second constant in the equations. Um, so it's a little bit like that three vortex problem that we heard about. Um, it's a third order nonlinear dynamical system with two, two invariants. So the solutions are periodic. And in the phase space of the variables A, N, and B, A, B, and N, three directions here, the trajectory of the solution is a closed curve. And there it is computed. And here, as functions of time, is what the solutions look like. Now here I've done it, well, I say it's a closed curve only in the frictionless case, because if you have friction, then energy is not conserved. So you won't have a closed curve. So zero friction, this is the behavior, the solutions. Solution point goes round and round. Solutions are periodic in time if the friction is zero. So in principle, the spin, now the spin is the blue curve, n as a function of slow time. It will reverse. Why does it reverse? Because red is the pitching amplitude. The pitching instability grows rapidly, extracts the energy, the n goes to zero. n goes negative. As soon as it goes negative, the pitching instability, uh, here I am pointing this now, <laughs> um, the pitching instability, as soon as the blue curve goes negative, um, red begins to decay, it is stabilized. Exponential decay, but the green curve is the rolling instability. It's a weaker instability, so it grows slowly. Slowly, slowly, it takes off. But green now begins to extract the energy. And so once again, n goes to zero. Working. n goes to zero and reverses, becomes positive. One power Okay, green again. <laughs> so then you see how it goes. Actually, that red, it's exponential decay for quite a long time, from t equals uh, about 5 up to about 20, when uh, the blue curve again, uh, well, the blue curve has crossed the axis. N has become positive, but it takes a long time, because the exponential decay has proceeded for a long time. It takes a long time for that pitching instability to grow the second time, but it does in the end. So then you see how the periodic behavior will ensue. And um, so that's with zero friction. Put on just a little bit of friction, and really these friction parameters now are quite small, but they're in, I've chosen them empirically in order to reproduce the behavior that is observed with the commercial rattleback. And for this, you see that the blue curve, that spin, we start off with positive spin. Um, the wobble, that is the pitching instability red, develops, extracts the energy, and the blue curve goes negative as a result. When it crosses the axis, all the energy is in the pitching mode. So it's gone negative. As soon as it's negative, again, red is stabilized, but green is destabilized. But very weakly destabilized because of all these damping coefficients. And the destabilizing N, or N is now, I'm sorry, the green curve, the rolling instability, is trying to take out the energy, but its amplitude is just so small that it doesn't succeed in causing a second reversal. Now the question is, can we devise a rattleback that does give more than one reversal? And uh, the answer is uh, yes, because I, I have one here. You have to make a big rattleback. And here it is. <laughs> I don't know if it'll work on this table, but uh, we can again experiment a little afterwards. By the way, I said right, there were interesting talks. And here is one before I show you this rattleback. I spin this top inside a receptacle. This is a very nice little silver dish. It comes from Scotland. It's called a quick. It's for drinking whiskey. I never travel without it. <laughs> well, it happens to be very good for spinning this little top. 
and uh, I hope I can spin it successfully. You may, you won't see it, but you may hear it. Um, I don't know if I've spun that quite successfully enough. Yeah, I think I have actually. And um, do it again, a little faster. No, too fast. Now it is spinning. Um, I will try and convect it in its spinning condition to Professor Chen. Uh, the fact that I'm moving means it won't, but he will observe it. We'll start it again here. We'll lay it here and uh, Professor Chen can witness. Uh, here we've got the lights. There's little lights flashing in there. Uh, and um, we'll see, that's a particularly good uh, top that will spin for a surprisingly long time. Professor Chen will tell us when it stops. But while we're waiting, <laughs> um, let me show you this. Now here's a professionally made rattleback, very well machined, although it's traveled quite a lot, so it, um, but it's very symmetrically made, but it has a steel bar screwed on top, and the angle of the bar can be changed, so we can change the chirality. I've set it to a fairly small value. That angle is about, oh, five degrees perhaps off of uh, the central axis. And um, let's try and rotate it. Immediately you see a wobbling instability and a, a reversal. So it reverses when we spin it that way, rotate it the other way, and there's a different kind of instability, and it also reverses. So we might get two reversals out of this on this surface. If I do this very, very carefully on a glass, Table. All right, on again. On the glass top table, this can be made to reverse four times. Is that still spinning, Professor Chen? Yes, it's spinning. Still <laughs> spinning. Is still lighting, still yeah, flashing? One and off, one and off. Yes, yeah. it's got little. You see, that is the most remarkable phenomenon. <laughs> yes, now that is something to explain. This has not, not been explained, this mechanism. It is, um, it has a name, it's called the perpetual top. <laughs> perpetual top. But to a proper explanation is, uh, is still, uh, in my view, lacking for this uh, rather extraordinary behavior. That it will spin and spin and spin. Now, well, there's got to be some little internal mechanism. There must be. There is a little battery inside. There is a little battery that is doing something, but it's still a great puzzle to understand because the angular momentum of a top, even with an internal mechanism, the total angular momentum you'd expect to decrease because of friction friction with the point of contact, friction with the air. And this does not. The angular momentum somehow remains constant. And that is somehow generated by the internal mechanism. Now that's amazing, because whatever internal mechanism you have, angular momentum is something. It can be changed, you know, transferred from the internal mechanism, maybe all sorts of little wheels inside. But not global, the total angular momentum of inside plus outside must be constant. Well, can't increase, will decrease because of the external friction. So we still have a difficult problem to solve. Somehow what is happening is that the internal mechanism is causing a slight wobble. It's causing a very slight wobble. Somehow, you don't, maybe you don't see it, it's tiny, but it's just enough to make to provide a positive torque at the point of contact of the top with whatever lies underneath. And it's that positive torque that keeps it spinning. It's still spinning. Yeah. 
This is amazing. <laughs> um, you have to stay here all night. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's an easy way to give a lecture. I just said the next thing. Or I could say, well, I'll stop, stop lecturing when the top stops. You see? <laughs> well, time's nearly up. I want to show you this uh, nice poster that we made two years ago for summer science exhibition at the Royal Society. And I, uh, this was the dynamic spin. And down here it refers to the Earth's magnetic field. So very quickly I'll take you through that. Here's the Earth's magnetic field. What on Earth has the Rattleback got to do with Earth's magnetic field? The Earth's field, well, was the liquid core of the Earth. Uh, right down in here and these are the lines of force and we are living on the outside somewhere and the field is a dipole field as we all know outside the earth's magnetic field is maintained by the self-exciting dynamo action of the flow of the earth's outer liquid core which is a molten alloy of iron and nickel the dynamo is widely believed to be of what's called the alpha omega type the omega effect is due to differential rotation in the core, resulting from conservation of angular momentum, our old friend. This has to be thought of as the analog of the spin, simply N, of the rattleback. The alpha effect is that due to helicity. I mentioned helicity in the lectures last week. It's due to helicity of turbulent core convection, due to the buoyancy of fluid particles or parcels released from the mushy zone at the inner core boundary. This helicity is actually a measure of chirality of the flow. It's the analog of the chirality of the rattlebed. We may think of the modes of convective instability in the core as being the analogs, or rather similar to the pitching and rolling instabilities of the rattleback. Now actually, the equations governing the alpha omega dynamo look rather similar to the equations that I showed you governing the uh, uh, this is battery, I think. Could be battery. are now partial differential equations, but they're not so terribly different. That I, um, this is like the pitching instability, you might say, but it actually involves the other field. And here's the alpha effect. And this is, uh, this is the Laplacian. So this is a diffusion and it's joule dissipation or joule diffusion. The damping effect analogous to the mu's, the mu1, mu2, mu3. And um, here's uh, the other field B, and here's the omega effect. It's a little more complicated. This is a Jacobian notation, but again, there's dual dissipation. The A and the B. A is, represents the merid meridional component of magnetic field. B, the zonal component. So both these components, they interact with each other through the fluid velocity. So A and B are amplitudes, proportional to meridional and zonal components of the magnetic field, lambda the joule resistivity analog of the mu. These equations, coupled with the relevant boundary conditions, very important, admit unstable solutions, i.e. growing magnetic field, when the dynamo number, something like this, magnitude of alpha times omega times r radius of the core to the power of four divided by lambda squared. Yeah, a little bit like a, a sort of Reynolds number, but more complex, more like a Rayleigh number, really, is sufficiently large. The dynamo, I mean, under these circumstances, the magnetic field grows exponentially. It can't go on forever. It saturates 
when the Lorentz forces, they're quadratic terms can I put, can in I the, the magnetic I field, control. grow strong enough to react back upon the flow and to suppress the alpha effect, which is responsible for the instability. So you can see similarities here with what's going on with the rattle bag. With a rattle bag, there are two instabilities, like convective instabilities, like instabilities of these two equations. Uh, of course, the derivation of these equations is difficult. These are mean field equations. There are slow, slow time scale equations as well. Um, but um, the two instabilities are like the instabilities that uh, appear here. And then the energy constraint for the rattle bag the equation for n slow time is very like the equation I have written it down, the equation involved it's the Navier-Stokes again, involving the back reaction of the Lorentz force. And that suppresses the instability. And so the mean field that develops on the slow time scale, well, it's the product of this complicated dynamics. Of course, there has to be a source of energy somewhere for the magnetic field of the Earth. That source is the convection, the rise of buoyant elements from the mushy zone, the fact that the heavy stuff is always condensing down and light stuff is released and rising upwards in the liquid core. So that's the analogy and that's why it is interesting. Lack of mirror symmetry or chirality is important in many branches of physics. The example I've given the air is just one out there in the cosmos. Many stars and planets have magnetic fields because of the electromagnetic dynamo action of the type I've described in their fluid interiors. This dynamo action arises whenever the fluid motion lacks mirror symmetry, in other words, has chirality. The rattleback is a simple toy, but nevertheless, it illustrates a profound principle of nature. Chirality can lead to surprising instabilities and unexpected behavior. Now I just end on this little comment. DNA is chiral. We all know about the double helix. The double helix is right-handed. It so happens. The question is, is the chirality, is the fact that it is not mirror symmetric, is that necessary for life? I suspect it is. It's a very sort of stable structure the double helix. Um, I'm assured by my biological friends at Trinity College that it is right-handed. Um, why is it right-handed? It's very, uh, a very, very interesting and challenging problem. So a very interesting mechanical problems down at that level of DNA and biology that are crying out for investigation. And that's why most of us are right -handed. It could be. Uh, well, there's something. There is. Uh, there is something there. <laughs> well, there I will stop. Thank you very much. Yes, of course. I think Professor Morfitz will take questions as long as the boy speaks. <laughs> It has stopped already. Any questions from the floor? Um, is there a dominance in the current of the magnetic field in the universe? Are there more ones? Um, I think probably not. If you take even the case of the Earth, I mean, I've glossed over a lot of this. It's in the northern hemisphere, the, uh, the helicity has one of the fluid motion has one sign predominantly. It's positive in the northern hemisphere in the liquid core, negative in the southern hemisphere. Uh, but these areas of one sign helicity are large enough, of course, volume, huge, huge volume of liquid, large enough to generate a magnetic field. So you generate the magnetic field similarly of one helicity. I mean, the magnetic field also has helicity. It has one helicity in the north, the opposite helicity in the south. Um, now, of course, that's probably true for the Earth and most of the planets and stars. But I, who knows when you get out into, into the galaxy? I mean, the same principles apply, uh, fluid continuum description. 
in, interest, in the interstellar turbulent medium? And I don't know the answer to the question out there. Now, it's a question of whether the Big Bang generated a bit of natural uh, helicity one way or the other. We don't know too much. It did? I think it did uh, because uh, it does not exist. This is what I, I, uh, I read. And, uh, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, after the Big Bang, we have matter and anti matter. And, and, and they deny each other. And in the end, we have more matter than anti matter. That's what we exist. And the matter so, is, yes. Well, that uh, matter anti matter is slightly different from right handed and left handed, yeah. but, but the two are similar in, in some respects. Well, the the curves of the magnetic field was known to is known to have the first time. Yes. Yes. Is it anything to do with the same kind of random band? Uh, yes, but it is different. It's it's um it's actually a chaotic system. Um and so the reversals are unpredictable. Uh, and they do occur I mean again I I've given such a simplified version of it. But when you include it, the, the reversals and the dynamics of reversals are still not fully explained. But um, they are extremely interesting, of course. You get a long period of the order of millions of years when the uh, polarity has one sign. And then in a period of about 10,000 years, that's the time scale for a reverse, a flip over. And it does, I think, flip over rather than going through zero. It rotates. It goes into big oscillations and then over all the way. Um, and there's a lot of work on that and trying to explain it in terms of uh, what the dynamics of the core. Um, but as I say, I don't think we have a fully uh, uh, an explanation that everyone agrees with. There's a question there, Peter. Your perpetual top, does it ever get fast? Is it only slow down or slow? No, it'll go, it'll continue for as long as the battery mechanism, whatever it is. But it doesn't increase it, it actually increases uh, to begin with, yes. You spin it, and if you haven't quite, you can hear it spinning up, getting faster. And then it reaches, it reaches um, an equilibrium speed. So there's some kind of feedback acting. And I think then when, when the speed naturally tends to fall, as soon as it goes below critical, it goes into an instability wobble. But that wobble is such that it speeds up again. Oh, that's a good question. The, um, it seems as if, of course, the, the, you're thinking of the angular momentum about the vertical, and it seems to change sign. Uh, and I should have said that. Yes, it's absolutely astonishing. That's why it's so astonishing. Even to little children, they look. And although they don't know about angular momentum, they can see that there's something strange. Well, you see, because of the wobble, the point of contact there's a frictional force at the point of contact. It's actually rolling friction in this case, but even when you have a rolling body, you have a frictional force acting on the rattle band. And that force has a moment about the center because it's tilted. And similarly, when it's tilted the other way, it has a smaller moment about the center. So there is a, a moment or a couple exerted by the table on the rattle back, which is capable of changing its angular momentum. And it does, changes it dramatically, reverses its sign. Now, so this is a paradox uh, that suggests initially that angular momentum is not conserved. And I have another toy that is equally paradoxical in relation to linear momentum. I like to claim it demonstrates that linear momentum is not conserved. But Newton was wrong, after all. But that's another story. I can show you um, maybe tomorrow.
sorry, I, I can't. Is the diagram showing the solution of the dynamics? Yes. Yes. Um, let's uh, go back to that. You want it with with friction or without friction? Without the periodic uh, solution, um, you see, there's a lot uh, more there. Which I, <laughs> this is the one without friction. Now, the green. Yes, they're out of phase. Well, yes, it is. It is absolutely important. Because it's when n, the blue curve, when n is positive, the red is unstable. When blue is negative, red is stabilized and green becomes unstable. And that is what you see. When you roll the rattle back one way, in one direction, it's the rolling that is unstable. In the other direction, it's more the pitching that is unstable. The rolling is, so going in one direction, pitching is unstable, rolling is stable. Going the opposite way, rolling is unstable, pitching is stable. And it's that that is causing the periodic reversals. You're saying you don't see this? You don't believe it? <laughs> it, look, it looks, I agree, it looks a little bit like that both ways. Um, let me, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure which way. That is mostly going that way, bit pitching. This way, it's different, it's a slower frequency. And it's, it ends up, I, it, it is difficult because the two are mixed up, but one is stable, the other is unstable. So it takes a little time for the unstable one to damp out and to see the, the one, that, you know, the one that's, that grows. <laughs> yeah, here we are. Yes, um, this Carol character doesn't have to be just a thing bent in a net. Uh, any helical object has chirality, and so will have curious mechanical properties. So, and um, these molecules, I mean, chemistry is full of chiral uh, molecules, as you, as you say, and uh, chemical interactions. I mean, a lot of chemistry is chiral chemistry. Um, and the, the manner in which the chirality is important, I, I think, is, is a fascinating question. And of course, the, uh, the, as you say, as you suggest, you move from chemistry to biology. Immediately, these questions arise in the biological context. I don't know the answers. I think there's a lot to be done there. That's what I say. I think it's a rich field for investigation. And it's actually, you see, it's me mechanics basic Newtonian mechanics that is the starting point. Of course, there are other things. There are all sorts of uh, complications in the chemical <coughs> context. But at least with this, you have a starting point. <coughs> Oh, no, I didn't say, oh, I, no, I, I didn't say, yeah, I may have said friction, but you see, rolling friction. When you have a rolling body, 
you've still got a frictional force, but it doesn't dissipate energy. That rolling friction is responsible for the change of angular momentum. Uh, no, it, it isn't. It isn't. You, with rolling friction, you can put pure rolling, mu can be zero. It's only it slip, uh, well, slips, or you take account of, I mean, the, the mu, as I say, we don't know how to calculate it. There's a slight plastic deformation, and all sorts of nasty things when you have two bodies in contact with each other. Okay, but perfect rolling with no dissipation, still there's a force that, that makes it roll rather than slip. And it is rolling, there's no doubt about that. Oh yeah, there's air friction, that, that's true, that's, uh, that's another, that is always present in, in practice. And whereas in this uh, little idealized simulation, it's ignored, we've done it in a vacuum. So is it one that in this case there is rolling friction, but it doesn't dissipate energy by nature of rolling? Yes. No motion yes. So to contrast with the case of the egg, the, the rising egg, there it is definitely slipping. It's not rolling. Slipping friction uh, that dissipates energy. But if pure rolling does, and with perfect conditions, does not dissipate energy. There's no slip condition. The force, the force exists, but it does no work. The mu here is a modal coefficient of dissipation. Yes, it's a, a co perhaps I should call it that, uh, a coefficient of dissipation. That's confusing. I shouldn't call it a friction. Uh, it's, 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 um, it's a dissipative effect of some kind that we don't fully understand. And it does include uh, air resistance. I mean, that is always present. But um, the solid mechanics people tend to say it's, there's always, there is always a dissipation when you have two, two bodies in contact. Uh, surprisingly, there's a little local deformation. Well, um, well we, we try to, we always want to unravel these trees out there. But, um, Professor Moffat has given us a wonderful lecture showing us that we have a lot of mysteries with toys and with devices that we make ourselves. And, and um, with this, um, <laughs> uh, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of the Institute, I would like to uh, present a little conversation uh, uh, Professor Moffat. Thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you.